Good afternoon, evening, and apologies for the late start. We are still, in fact, missing one of our guests. We are hoping Mr. Marty Morgan will join us later. Not quite sure what's going on there. But this is second part of our Normandy assessment of where we are in understanding its history. And we're focusing on the German side. Of course, we will be mentioning the Allied side as well, because it's just going to come up in the conversation. And joining me, yeah, two of the hopefully eventually three guests, we have Jonathan Ware, who is Reassess History, who has been doing some incredible work on Twitter over the last few years, re-examining re a lot of what we thought we knew about the Normandy campaign. Of course, Niels, who is a rising star, in especially in terms of understanding the German side of things and frequent visitor to the German archives and understand the German records. And Marty, hopefully, will join us later. So for those who watched Thursday's show, and I hope most of you did watch the Thursday show, we kind of tackled with Professors McManus, Bechtold, and um, Buckley the way the understanding of Normandy history has gone over the last few decades. But this tonight, it's all about the Germans and the German side. But to start off, I'm going to ask our two guests how they got into the Normandy history. What were their first books they read? And did reading what they read first influence their initial understanding of the Normandy campaign. So we'll go with Niels first in the Netherlands. So what was your, what was your first book, Niels? Uh, well, my first introduction to Normandy was probably actually uh, The Longest Day. It was in, in my early teens when I was building uh, models. And my dad said, well, what do you know about Normandy? Well, I didn't really know anything about Normandy. So we said, well, let's let's take a, let's watch uh, the longest day, and that was sort of uh, an eye opener and and very interesting. And I decided, well, let's go to the library and let's see what they have there because I really want to know more. And one of the first books for me was this one by Stephen right. Betsy. Yep. Uh, great, great if you're if you're a teenager. A lot of lot of pictures. Uh, a lot of tank stuff uh, discussed in it, and it's also in it, uh, the, was also the time when uh, Discovery Channel did fairly okay documentaries for that period on uh, on the fighting in Normandy and the Second World War, and that's basically how I got into the into Norm into Normandy. And then there was uh, at that same time there were uh, forums uh, starting like Missing Links, where there was a lot of uh, uh, tank discussions going on and research. So from a fair fairly early point I got into uh, into research uh, there was a couple of archives who were also starting to uh, digitize photographs which allowed for the research to, to continue and that's uh, basically how, how I rolled from the standard uh, Panthers, ta uh, Tigers, Shermans and at some point I decided well wait a minute the French tanks are far more interesting and that's how I first looked into the 24th Panzer Division and then I ended up in the Coton Tan Peninsula, where where I decided to to look into those units, and I realized very quickly that everything that had been written was quite poor, uh, inco incorrect, or just missing a lot of information. So I started to work on that, and then you, it didn't take a long time before I started. Well, maybe I, I wrote a few articles on it, and and then people said, "Why don't you write a book?" And being a silly teenager at the time, I thought, well, why not give it a try? And then came the, the realization that the German context in what had been published is com almost completely missing. So you can't write, in my opinion, I couldn't write a, a book about armor on the Golden Temple Peninsula, American and German, before looking into the context, which is sort of where I am now and what got out of hand. And that's basically what I've been spending the, the last 10, 15 years on right now. Yeah. And for those watching, there, there's not many of us who haven't had to, needed to tap into Niels's knowledge over the last few years, myself and Marty Morgan and Sean Claxton or many others. If we have a question about the Germans in Normandy, it's there's a first port of port of call. Nielsopedia, I suppose we should start calling it now in terms of Germans. But now let's turn to Jonathan. So, you, you know, you, 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 I first was aware of you, Jonathan, because of your work writing a book about the 53rd Welsh Division, but you've kind of moved on to talking about all sorts of aspects of the Normandy campaign. So same question to you. What was your first um, entry point to the Normandy campaign and did, did it sort of shape your understanding? Uh, 1994, I was a kid and it was the uh, anniversary and I guess I watched it on TV. My mum and dad bought me the, you know, those stamp set, which I should have bought down. And uh, yeah, so I saw that on television and that was quite interesting. 
And I was like, oh, this is really cool. This is really big. And I was six in 94. Um, and I thought this, you know, interesting. I didn't like guns and tanks and stuff as a kid, really, strangely enough. Um, I liked rough stuff as a teenager. Um, but then we had this, like, amazing cocktail in, like, the uh, early 2000s because you get Middle of One Allied Assault, and that blew my world because you're landing on Omaha Beach, charging up. It's phenomenal. Uh, then you get Band of Brothers coming at a very similar time in that series because initially I thought Airborne was about planes because I didn't give a shit about round stuff. Sorry, I'm, I'm behaving tonight. I'm not going to swear. Um, no, 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 no. I set myself a goal of behaving. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, um, and uh, I saw Band of Brothers. I thought this is phenomenal because I wanted to watch this stuff about planes, but this ground stuff, what the hell is this? They've got like blood jumping out of planes. This is crazy stuff. Um, same part Ryan as well uh, later on. Um, but then again, like Bridge Too Far, I'm I'm 33. Uh, that was old hat before I got into this, although the film I really enjoyed. Um, Call of Duty World War II, Sudden Strike, those sort of games uh, really got me into it. And then um, tabletop gaming like Flames of War, the source books for Flames of War used to be one of the most accessible ways into the Second World War as a whole because you'd get your company-level organisations, a good chunk of history, scenarios, models, company-level boxes. It was really good. I don't think it is good anymore, though. I think they've jumped the shark a bit for various reasons. Um, but that's how I sort of got into it. And then when I went to university, a mate of mine, John Evans, said to me, did you know there was a Welsh division? I was like, no. So I Googled it and got three results, and then I went a bit mad. And then at some point, I decided to be interesting at a party. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, they, they said to me, so, so what do you do then? And I'm like, I'm, uh, uh, I'm writing a book on the Welsh division in the Second World War. Yeah, totally doing that. And that's how that sort of started, which I would not recommend to most people as a career choice because it should be considered on some level. But that's what happened. And the more you dug at that sort of, it's a ball of string. You throw the ball of string, you start following it. You start finding more and more unravels about what you know. And you discover more and more along the way, which is really, really interesting. Because uh, Niels and I come from a younger demographic. Uh, most of our exposure would have been through gaming. Um, and then book-wise, uh, I guess it was uh, Ambrose Pegasus Bridge was the first thing I read. But again, I, I really care about the planes for many years. I didn't mm. care about ground stuff until I realised no one wrote about it. So. And interesting, folks, that we have our War Games show tomorrow night where we are talking about the, the role of games in people understanding history and where they 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 get their history from and you know we had the comic shows and you know, i'm a comics and war films guy gaming was kind of around when i was a kid but escaped to cold it's board game um there was a night fighters game for the zx spectrum that was very slow and clunky but it was uh, it was some kind of night gunner thing but anyway we're here to talk about the germans in normandy so the first point I've we have got some topics we're going to go through tonight folks and hopefully marty will join us and, um, and add to it but my the first point is is that the old cliche of the victors write the histories is absolutely true with regards to World War II to some extent. And the initial books we discussed the same thing on Thursday that were written about the Normandy campaign, where they were written particularly for the veterans, the families of those who'd served. They're written for a kind of a, a grateful public who had just seen the you know, the war come to an end and rationing end and cities being built. And the first question is at that time. Did anybody really care about the German sides? Were they were they just a faceless enemy that everything was about? Our troops did this. We destroyed this. We pushed through there. We killed these Germans here. We killed these Germans there. And at that time, did anyone actually care about the German side? So that's the that's the yeah, the first point where I'm gonna I'm gonna make there um, about just the 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 lack of interest. And then when the German stuff is mentioned in these early accounts, it's often wrong. Niels, I want you to bring in and mention this idea about the average age. It was a very good point you made um, and for the people watching. So talk talk about the the, the, the point you found out. Uh, well, there's uh, quite a few stories uh, that are very popular still today. Um, you even mentioned a lot. Uh, one of the things is the, the 36 as the average age, for instance, in the... 709th Infantry Division, which defended Utah Beach, uh, but also uh, all the stories and, and mentions of the, the stomach units and the ear units where Germans uh, gathered uh, yeah, troops with, with stomach ailments or, and poor hearing. And a lot of that goes back to a single book. 
cross-channel attack, which it was written in 1951. And it's actually a commendable book. It's, it's still very interesting. Uh, it made a very serious effort in uh, getting an understanding for the German side of it, but of course, this was not their primary objectives. And it gets some things right and it gets some things wrong. And these two things are uh, two of the things they, one they get really wrong and the other one is questionable. Uh, to start with the stomach units, the book sort of suggests that there were all of in divisions. Actually, there was only one division which didn't exist yet on D-Day, but it's still being told. And this is exactly how myths about the German troops in Normandy are continued to be told. And it has very little to do with reality. And it's mentioned in a book from 1951, published in 1952, I think. And when you look at the age of the 709th Infantry Division, this 36 is mentioned already in this book. And when you look at the source material they use, it's a single account from a German officer. And it's part of sort of an excuse, well, explanation of why their division failed to uh, hold Cherbourg. And then blaming it on the age of your troops is, uh, of course, one of the reasons that you say, well, our, our troops were very poor. And still, this, this, this 36 has taken on a life of its own. You see it mentioned in every single generation of books that has been published since that time. It, it's in the most recent books. It has been published in the, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the zeros, and also uh, and the most recent books. And when you look at it and you look at the division itself, you think, well, it was 30 plus, which is basically quite normal for no for Normandy and, and actually for the entire German army at the time. But 36 is just unlikely, actually. But it's still being repeated. And it's not questioned. It's just assumed to be true. And that's, I think, a, uh, a big problem for a lot of what's written about the Germans. A lot of it is based on what has been written before and assumed that those authors did their research properly. But they yeah. didn't. I mean, and that's, that's what we're going to explore tonight, is the fact that a myth about the German side is likely to take root and hold easier and for longer than a myth about the Allied side because of the people who are reading the books. If in those early books in the 50s and 60s, Cornelius Ryan had got the average age wrong in an Allied division, I'm sure people would have written in, wouldn't they? They'd have said, no, hang on, we, they weren't all that age, I was there. But from the German side, less Germans reading, less, less, less books available in the German language, so the myths just the, the the errors don't get checked, they don't get fact checked, they don't get um, examined, and therefore they they still endure. And you know, we, we before we went online we, we, for this show tonight, we were talking about a podcast we all heard uh, last. We won't name it, but it was repeating the same the same myths, the same errors, the same false assessments of the Germans on in on indeed day and in Normandy generally, and and it's just such a shame. So. The next thing we're going to bring up is um, this, again, the, continuing the idea of the fact that did anyone really care about the German side? Were, was it the Allied side that drove things all through that earlier period? So when we talked on Thursday about what we called the kind of Max Hastings, um, Carlo Deste era of bigging up the Germans as they had the best tanks, they had the best armored vehicles, they were the most dedicated units, they, they never gave up, and that, that aspect kind of got entrenched. Um, what what do you think? I mean, your research, Niels. What were the Germans writing about themselves at that time, or were they really not writing about themselves? I don't mean the archives. We'll touch on the archives later. I mean, were the Germans attempting to understand their own divisions at that time? There's relatively little has been been written about, especially when you look at the at the infantry divisions. Uh, I think that the most important thing that Germans published uh, was. Uh, were stories from people who, who were there, uh, key officers, which is, I think, also quite dominant, uh, what they wrote, uh, their accounts, their bio uh, on the Allied side. And I think a lot of that is still based on the assessment of those particular officers, how they uh, looked at the situation, uh, how they defended themselves, the mistakes they made, they how they blamed others. Uh, and the Germans sort of fit in. I mean, simply the fact that we're still a lot of people are still relying on this book, which was written by an SS propaganda officer. Is sort of telling. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So I'm going to bring in Jonathan now because you've been sitting waiting patiently. So the next thing we want to talk about is this, and it's a continuation of what I just said, that the, what I call the Max Hastings color destiny. This is when you start to get the the, the myths of the, the Knight's Cross, the tank, the German tank aces, the Noble SS, the, the, the Kampfen groups, all this this sort of um, efficiency of the German army. You know, you, you said that yourself, uh, you know, you're from a younger generation than myself and the people on Thursday. Um, how significant was that era, era and how hard has it been to move on from that? And when you've been doing all the reassessment you've been doing on Twitter recently, what were kind of the breakthrough moments for you when you looked at all that and realized a lot of that wasn't just wasn't worth the paper it was written on? I think... It's very easy to look. Basically, it's, it's the eighties. It we we're going back to a banging soundtrack. You can make a probably good film about all the craziness that happened. You get two major books in the eighties which come out, which is Hastings and De Est, and then Beaver. By which I mean Beaver wrote his book about what ten years ago or something, and it should have come out in the eighties because it's that dated. Yeah. Um, and and I think that's worth mentioning because I probably would have less trunk with Beaver if his book had come out then, I'd be like, yeah, cool, fine. Or in the early to mid nineties, it came out way too late and it argues stuff way too late. But I think this, I think this is actually probably enough where Hastings and um, De Est get quite a bit of their stuff from. I've skimmed it a few times and it's a book by SME and Belfield. Mm -hmm. And that one. it contains quite a lot of the early sort of revisionist stuff about 20 years early. Um, it's from 67, I think off the top of my head. Um, so there is a, a track of oh, 65. There is a there is a fraction earlier. What we get uh, with the Hastings factor is crazy. So De Est and Hastings have more or less been in. Oh, Marty there. Um, uh, they've been in more or less a constant reprint with minor edits for reasons which you hear about and potentially can't discuss for certain reasons and paragraphs removed and things for about 20 years, which is well, actually now longer, nearly 40 years, which is insane. And they're constantly updated given really spicy uh, covers, lovely production, and you think it's a new book, you're actually reading something which has been discredited quite a long time ago. Um, and I think that that was a problem. And then Hastings and the others ended up informing this new generation. They ended up consulting extensively on media to a huge extent. I mean, uh, there, some, there was been some speculation that some of them um, consulted on more than 100 uh, documentaries apiece. Which is, which is crazy, going from the 90s to 2000s. And we get this amazing effect where there is the same base reading being used. It's the same sources. Uh, all the, almost every myth about a tiger tank goes back to these people. Um, and for me, Hastings is very much his um, uh, father's son. I think his dad would have written the same book, is my strong suspicion. Because um, it sort of, it feels, it has this whole air of homage to it. Um, and tr yeah, trying to break it's a huge problem because those books in the 80s were effectively unchallenged until the early 2000s. Um, and they were, when they emerged, they help inform a lot. Although people tell me I'm wrong, I, I, you speak to enough people, it doesn't feel that way. We, we know that by that point, Hastings was, as discussed the other night, closely integrated into the British Army's establishment's thinking structures. He's learning from them, they're discussing ideas. Um, Von, I don't think Von Luck's memoir would have ever gained gone anywhere if he wasn't endorsed by the british army and nato to the extent he was frankly yep. uh because as discussed a lot of his products um but that wasn't debunked by daglish till 2000 and what three or so i think so it takes a very long time to debunk and it's uh, when we get to archives later on i'll cover why it's harder to debunk than it is to make some something up um but again i mean a lot of the sales that we assume were quite good in the 40s and 70s probably weren't I know for a fact most of the Welsh histories on the period were pulped because they never sold. Um, so there's and there's also a, a tendency like the Welsh divisional history only has eleven pages on Normandy, um, wow. with most of the battle summed up in about five of that. So they write longer about Northern Ireland, and there's there is a lot of formations trying not to write about things, um, and it could be because your divisional commander dies young or doesn't want to talk about things, or people leave the military and especially the first 20 years after the war, don't want to chat about it too much. Um, but it's sort of this a perfect storm of problems. But then trying to unravel it, that means we have to go back to the archives, and that's probably going to come up later. 
Yeah, well, definitely. Right. Well, well, let's let's welcome Marty. Uh, good evening, Marty. I'm glad you're here. Um, and we were just filling in, waiting until we got here. Really, we've just been talking about the weather, really. No, but um, I want to bring in you because you know people are familiar with you. You've been on World War Two TV shows before, but we basically just introduced where we where we first got our understanding of Normandy from. So, kind of over to you, Marty. What was the first thing you read about the Battle of Normandy? And being truthful, how much did that influence your thinking? And for how long did it influence it? All right, brace yourselves because this is going to be bad. Okay. Stephen Ambrose. Yeah. I knew that was coming. Hey, I knew that was coming, right? That's That train's never late. I was a graduate student in uh, from uh, a graduate student in history from 1991 until 1996 when I completed my master's program. And if you think about the Ambrose books that came out during that time period, there's they're basically the three big ones as it relates to his World War II writings. And that would be... Band of Brothers was first, then D-Day, the climactic battle of World War II, followed, of course, by Citizen Soldier. Those all came out when I was living the experience of a graduate student. And they, at the time, I remember the feeling, they felt timely, they felt new, they felt fresh. And I look back on all of them and I cringe now. When I, to think that the way that I consumed those writings and accepted them as as being uh, a contemporary orthodoxy, understanding not just the broader picture of World War II, but specifically the German side, because I believe Jonathan was just commenting about this in a, in a very educated way, more so than I can. But the, I remember when the Ambrose books came out, it felt fresh and new because finally it felt like we were getting the German perspective in a fresh and new way. Try not to roll your eyes when I say that. <laughs> But I remember reading them and thinking, hey, wow, I'm really now beginning to get an insight into the German perspective on D-Day, for example. And in retrospect now, uh, I, I believe that the insights offered in the Ambrose books were definitely not fresh and new, but rather just retellings of old mythologized narratives that had their origins in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, absolutely. And we had a question come in earlier about the the original um the German memoirs that came out, the generals, you know, and the, the the people part of the Third Reich, and I'm and my first comment on that, of course, is most senior German officers were very much that had survived, by the way, were thinking about their own asses in 1945 and whether or not they were going to get caught up in war crimes and this, that, and the other, and there was lots of shifting of the blame for errors to anybody else that wasn't them. And as interesting as they can be, and Hans von Luck, although he wasn't the general, I think, again, falls in that kind of category of, of um, self-promotion, dis disassociation from, of himself from the Nazis, kind of trying to pump himself up as a, as a noble soldier. And I think that you could apply that to many of the of those German memoirs. Post I'm not talking about the Kurt Meyer kind of one. That starts getting ridiculous. But what's anyone's comment on those sort of German memoirs, the general's ones, and how we can almost throw them away completely in terms of balance. Niels, do you want to jump in on that? Or Jonathan, Niels? Uh, well, to put it bluntly, I'm not using them. Yeah. Or as little point. as possible. Um, what one of the, what I f still find interesting are the uh, foreign military studies, which uh, captured key officers were offered uh, an opportunity to, to write about their experiences, often uh, sort of given an assignment, which they then did. Uh, those already show that problem, but they were written, most of them were written within five years of the war. So it's sort of fresh. Uh, the guys, uh, the, the officers are, are still in the uh, prisoner of war camps and they're interesting because of the time they were written and some things are absolutely relevant and you can cross check with, with other records and other things, it's just opinion and blame game and stuff like that. So I've tried to stay, what I'm doing right now is basically staying away as far as possible from uh, accounts from generals and key officers, unless there is stuff in it where I can say, okay, this adds something, this is believable, but, but their self-promotion is just something that, yeah, a lot of what they've written is just useless. I mean, in terms of balance, there's lots of self-promotion in the Allied generals' memoirs as well. I mean, yeah. the ones who are in the middle of their political careers, for example, are are painting things in light. And you know, I know there's the popularity these days of criticizing James Gavin. I actually like James Gavin's book. I think it's a really good book. But there's lots of um, 
I'm in the middle of my career and I'm writing this book the way I wanted to, want myself to be perceived by the public. And I think I, if I was still, if I was serving, that I would do a book about me the same way. As Churchill famously said, I, I know I'll go down well in history because I'm going to write my own history. That's, that's, that's how to do it. But Jonathan, the, the going back to memoirs again, um, and the German general mem the generals and things, I think we're going to bring up that other point I was going to come up to, which is this idea of this splitting of history, because there's those first or 20 years when no one's really talking about the Germans. Then there's the start, the, the groundswell begins. And then you get that real production of books about the Germans, but they're for a particular niche type of market. I mean, all those kind of panzers. And we all know the books I'm talking about. It's the ones where all the covers are emblazoned with runes and pictures of tiger tanks and black and silver and Gothic lettering. And they're packed full of photos of tanks and blown up tanks and panzerfaust and things. And I, I'm, I've never really bought those books because that I've never felt those books are aimed at me. And do we think there has been this split? And there are the books about the Germans for the German. And I don't want to call them fanboys because because that that is dismissing them as one cliched group. But I think what what's your feelings on that? Well, Jonathan, the the the, the writing for two different types of audience. These these you, we all know the books we're talking about. Those. I don't know what you call them. Really. How would you describe those books, Jonathan? Uh, fetish, um, fetish, which is probably over the word, edgy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I usually what's it like? Um, I I can go on quite a drunken rant on this. Uh, a Nazi wearable fetish, a fetish bollocks, or um, or you know, sort of like SS tigers in the mud nonsense. Uh, oddly enough, like weirdly enough, I, I agree. Foreign military studies stuff is really interesting, and some of those have ended up being branded as a, like interviews with veterans by certain historians who I'm not going to name actually because I can't remember who they are and then being sold in a book format for 12, 14 quid where you can find most of the FMS stuff for online or pay fold three for the usage and you can usually get free fold three access which is brilliant. Um, one of the best archival things out there. Um, Kurt Mayer's one as well has been rebranded many times. I did find some use in it because it ties in with Welsh sources which really surprised me. Um, there's some very strange stuff and most of the German general accounts about Falaise are a complete basket case because they're all disagreeing and rang with each other. Um, but when it comes to how it all slots together, I think quite a lot of the more mainstream history from the 80s to early 2000s bought, bought is apologia. I think there's a lot of really suspect stuff. I think certain people are saying things which they're not saying directly, but I've met too many people who've read these books. So when I was at university, I used to play a game. I'd give uh, a stack of five books. I've got the list somewhere. One of them was uh, always Beaver. Uh, one was Dest and, I oh, know it was Hastings, later Beaver. Um, and I'd ask people to explain to me how the Allies won, which I used to think was, a, I used to, this was to see if I was mad because I couldn't work it out from any of these books. And every person I gave this stack to who played the game to my own, you know, torturous sense of humour, no one could tell me how the Allies won, uh, which is weird because... If you're reading a book on Normandy, the Allies, you know, win the campaign. So how can't we work Spoiler it out? alert, folks. The Allies won the Normandy campaign. Just in case there's someone <laughs> yeah, watching. Right. Heard it. You heard it here first. <laughs> oh, and by the way, that just I'm just to interrupt. That, that is, there is a famous story amongst guides in Normandy about a guide who got back to Bayer after a two or three day tour and said, well, thank you very much, folks. That's it. That's the end of the tour. I hope you've learned something. And, and a personal tour said, you haven't finished yet. And the guide said, well, we, we've done the cemetery now. We've kind of bought things. So you haven't, we're not all history buffs, this person said. You haven't told us who won. And the guide assumed it was a joke, gave a, a short pause to allow the joke to hit, to, to find its foot, realized it wasn't a joke, and then said, which was a really good way of responding, what tour was the, what language was the tour conducted in? <laughs> English, <laughs> the Allies won. But this person genu appeared to genuinely not know who had won the Normandy campaign. Now, on my tours, I don't necessarily expect people to remember the date of the Battle of Midway or who the assistant divisional commander of the 9th Division was in August 44, those things. But not knowing we won? Anyway, that's that's a, a little story I thought I'd share there. It's it's a legendary one there, and that always gets a, oh, my God, when you're telling it when the pub. That's that, that's a guarantee. Get a round bought for you. But, Marty, let's uh, this 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 divergence of history. Um, you know, you're the sole American in this panel here. Is that a European thing? Is it America? Because I think of that as particularly being a rather European thing, those kind of niche books. Or did they make it to the USA as well? Oh, they have. And in fact, they overpower it. And I feel a bit apish and goonish among this 
this esteemed group because there was a period where I kind of consumed some of that stuff. As I was a lot younger, I literally was a high school student that, you know, anything that talked about tiger tanks, I was down for it. Um, I, I may be flattering myself to think that I've moved on and I've gotten better since then, but there is such an enormous audience for that sort of thing that here I am much later in life and I find it quite difficult to nudge people away from, as Jonathan, I think correctly indicated, the fetishization of the German military in the Second World War. It has reached such um, a, an overpowering and dominating level in the United States that I find it extremely difficult to talk about the German military during the, war, the Second World War with people because I'm frequently confronted by these very stark mythologies uh, just to give you one example, I remember one of the greatest arguments that I ever had was in the foyer of the of um, the uh, Memorial de Caen. I had walked in with a tour group back before 2020 when I was tour guiding actively, actively, and we were standing inside. Somebody had asked some sort of generalized question, and I was commenting to a group of about 10 of my clients about uh, the German perspective. And one of my clients interrupted me, and she said, you know, the Germans lost the war because um, they had one evil, crazy person in command of everything. They lost the war because they had no flexibility. German officers couldn't um, improvise the way that Americans could. And also they were terrified of Adolf Hitler and they wouldn't wake him up on D-Day. And so she interrupted what I was saying, which I felt was quite a bit more educated than that. Uh, to basically throw out those those three pieces of mythology. And I mentioned the story, not just because it's kind of slightly funny, but because that story functions as the perfect metaphor explaining the breadth of my experience with attempting to discuss this with Americans. And I mean it to this extent, that the American consumer audience, the, the audience of Americans who will lift a finger to read a little bit more about the Second World War, when they lift that finger, what do they get? Hastings, Beaver, and Ambrose. Yeah. And I think we should mention Michael Reynolds. Someone wanted us to, to bring up Michael Reynolds, and, and that came up on Twitter the other day as well. I think I've got three Michael Reynolds books, and I literally haven't opened them for about 20 years. They sit there on a lower shelf. As, as I, I don't know about you guys. I kind of move books up and down like a ranking. <laughs> and there's, there's a bottom corner near the radiator. The, if, if, you're, if, if you come to my house and your book is there, it's... Actually, one of your books is near there, Marty. It's only because it's the big one. The big one with the photos in is there. <laughs> but yeah, I kind of move them around. But Michael Reynolds definitely falls into that black cover, silver writing, gothic gothic style, you know, the German flexibility, the German ability to counterattack, all that stuff. The Allies were hopeless. We couldn't knock out anything with our tanks. Our tanks were useless. And we can hopefully later on the show go down to the specific enduring tropes and myths and, and legends that just won't die mg 42s um all that kind of stuff but um you know we're at this point where we're we're talking about this sort of splitting of the normandy history of the german history but i think it's time now to kind of be more positive for a bit of the conversation talk about what there actually is out there in terms of the german archives and why they have been not used as much as they can and the first point i think i'm going to make is clearly language I don't speak any German. I can recognize certain German words in German documentation. But my experience of the German archives I've got is they're very technical, very wordy, using language that's not easy to kind of understand. The 2020. It's not conversational German. It's very... The words, I mean, they'd, they'd be great Scrabble scores. You get them on a, <laughs> on a, on a triple X, you know, where it's a triple... What, yeah, get great scores. So, Niels... Tell, tell us a little bit about your journey of beginning to get into the German archives and how you began to find stuff and what there is available there. And, 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 and yeah, enlighten us. Uh, well, one, I think a, a main reason I think that German archives haven't been used more uh, is language, but there's another issue. I think it's also because for a lot of units, there are no records left. So if you're looking purely from a campaign point of view, it's very difficult for a lot of units and a lot of parts of the campaign to actually find units uh, reports. So you need to go up a level. You need to go to Army Corps level. And in my case, I'm looking uh, the sector I'm looking for is the 84th Army Corps. And their records for 1944 are mostly gone. 
so th there's that uh, complicating factor. So then you uh, move up one more level and you end up at seventh army level. Now, there are their records, uh, a lot of them survived. I believe uh, their war journal has been translated into English and is available sort of at the Imperial War Museum. Uh, I've not used it myself because I use the uh, German original. Uh, so that's a good place to start if you want to uh, get an understanding of how they were uh, experiencing things and then you can move up uh, another level to Army Group B and Army Group T, uh, Obey West. Uh, so that's sort of how, how you can build uh, a framework and then you can start to look into uh, more specifically into units. And the fun bit is a lot of it is already uh, available uh, on online. Uh, internet access is to an extent uh, sufficient to, to do a lot of research at, in this uh, day and age. A lot of uh, German microfilms uh, were made at the National Archives in the United States. Uh, you can order them. Uh, a lot, there's a, an entire community sharing these. And this is a great way to get an understanding of uh, what was going on. Now, if you want to go even want to go the other way, you want to go deep into certain units, then uh, you get uh, at a point where you need to go to the archives because uh, the German archives, uh, not everything has been digitized. Uh, they're, they're doing a great job digitizing stuff. For instance, uh, they have uh, digitized almost the entire uh, archives of the uh, General der Panzertruppen. So a lot of armored material is freely available online right now. Uh, it's a mess to work through, but that, but it, it's, it is there. Uh, but if you want to look into individual units, you still have to go to, to the archives and, and see how far you want to take it. Uh, because if you also, there's a lot of material actually available in, in the English language. If you go to uh, unit uh, allied uh, records, uh, intelligence, there's a lot of material they discovered, uh, they, they shared among units, a lot of it is available, readily available online, uh, various archives have, have these available uh, G2, G2 studies, uh, reports, uh, S2 reports in the American sector which I'm studying. Uh, a lot of material actually is available but it's a, a lot of effort to gather everything and if you need to be really really into it to re and be able and willing to spend the time to do so, which is also one of the reasons I'm doing my book project, to to do this work so other people don't have to, and they can use hopefully my work to to have solid understanding without having to do all this work over again themselves, because like I said, a lot of myths are repeated from from books that have been written in English for decades, just because there is no German alternative. True, good German campaign books about the uh, Normandy. I, I really can't think of any. When, when, and when you say it as bluntly as that, that is staggering. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, if I was to take, for example, I mean, I've not only have I got a hundred first airborne shelf, I've got a five oh six shelf because of just the amount of stuff, and I've got an easy company shelf beyond that as well, and a shelf on eighty second airborne. I've got a shelf on the British Army in Normandy. So, same amount of books on the British Army in Normandy. So I have on one regiment of one division my german shelf which is the germans in entire of the war is one shelf so and i think some of them are french books but anyway if we now good. accept that there are there is access to german archives and there is information out there the next pertinent question i think is if it's there why aren't historians using it more and is the answer to that question is because the audience don't really care and the audience will just accept everything they get presented to them anyway so why bother to go there, why bother to go to Germany? Why bother to learn German? Why bother to do it if whatever you say about the Germans is going to be either ignored or taken completely on without checking by the authors? What's what's the incentive for the historian to do it unless the historian really cares? This is maybe a, a, a more complicated question, but you, Jonathan, I'm going to bring it to you and then bring it to Martin in a second. It is fair to say your tweets over the last few months have been absolutely extraordinary. People like Mike Bechtold sending messages to me saying, you know, who is this guy and how is he able to, in a few tweets, take stuff we've been thinking about for 20 years and boil it down and make all these incredible points? So um, what's your what's your take on this general reluctance by many mainstream historians to access the German side of things? I'm going to take a dramatic breath and think <laughs> uh, think about that for a second. And by the way, I've, I've known the, these questions are coming, and I'm, I'm always curious not to upset anyone with my answer generally. Uh, I'm playing nice. I'm playing nice. You're playing very um, nice, yeah. So 
I think actually it's a bit of a weird one. So what, what if, uh, when I was researching the Welsh division, I wanted to know who they were fighting against. And uh, by the way, if you saw my bookcases of shame and my good ones, you'll see loads of weird German shit in there. Like <laughs> I've already been naughty, but um, lo- there's loads of uh, esoteric texts. Uh, I go to cha- uh, charity shops, car boots, uh, you name it. And I pick up anything I find cheap. Which, and I've, there's even some privately published stuff by truly bizarre people. Um, because I'm looking for different takes the whole time and then trying to trace it back because I want to know more about the Germans in Normandy. And the best unit I found about is 277th Infantry Division, who've got two damn good books by Wingolf Scherer on them. And they have some diaries in them. There's a lot of, quite a bit of photographs in the Normandy one. And they explore the German soldier from the ground up. Now, my German at school was better than my French. And then, actually, I believe it's easier to learn World War II German because the technical language is a language one has to learn just to understand the documents. And you can actually follow quite a bit through just with the technical language. Um, potentially easier than some of the British stuff at times. Uh, there are lots more Germanists emerging, but they're, they're in different fields. There's loads of Germanists, uh, loads of Brits and Americans in Holocaust studies and stuff. And th- I've, I now have a question about how Normandy fits into the genocide states and the, the overall war of genocide. And then on the Allied side, how interwar uh, colonial actions figure into how we're fighting a war generally and you start developing these bigger t- thoughts and talking to more people but to get to the point uh which is always risky why don't people do it um this is going to come to archives more pointedly but i think cost is a huge factor victoria taylor's doing loads in german archives for her stuff uh on uh, uh the luftwaffe and i'm really curious where that goes i'm i i'm massively in fascinated by the Luftwaffe in Normandy because no one talks about it. And it's a huge point. Where are the Luftwaffe in Normandy? Um, they're there, but no one talks about it. And I'm convinced the Air Power Brigade don't want to talk about it for modern defence reasons, frankly. So if you're listening, you know where I stand on that one. Um, and But then again, I mean, there's some crazy stuff. So 277 Infantry have two books about it. And then there's at least a third one by the divisional commander's granddaughter who's arguing against her to defend her grandfather's war record, which I've not read because it's quite hard to get hold of. And it's hard to get hold of German history. You have to know what you're searching for. It's rarely translated to English. And we also know that on the continent, continental publishers have an easier time with image rights um, generally. Um, Actually, that's due to the EU copyright directive and stuff. And there seems to be a lot more support and grassroots enthusiasm for these sort of projects. So you're probably guaranteed to sell a lot of it. I mean, I remember being in Normandy and seeing books in French on topics about Normandy. You would never see republished in English because the market interest wasn't there or it was too niche, uh, which I thought was really bizarre because, you know, why is it not in English? So you may get them in French and other languages, but not necessarily R1. Um, Then again, it also comes back to access. Now, I know, again, they may be listening, there are certain German historians who have had access to German veterans associations and have been blocking access for other historians to have access to them. And if you are listening, you're a bad person, frankly, because all you're doing is Mm. you're just killing the skills. Um, And I do think there is, we get onto the question of politics, we get onto the question of war crimes, and we get onto questions of the SS quite quickly and modern apology uh, by certain historians. Um, so if we're not looking at that, re- those records, you can put other stuff in. Now, what I thought was fascinating as well was in Beaver, Beaver mistranslates or misrepresents. It depends which way you want to take it. Some German accounts quite badly regarding artillery. Um, and cause I sourced out the original German and I thought this is, this is not representative of this source. It's a very carefully edited chunk. And then the problem was loads of historians did want more German stuff. By the time we get into the year 2000s, we're, we're thirsty for it. Now, that's why the British Army in the 80s and 70s and stuff was inviting German veterans on to talk and give their experience to the British Army. Um, and I do think there was a, a lot of a lot of what went wrong that starts with this war studies attitude and military desire to focus and cherry pick parts of the campaign. Um and these people then get books published. They then get extensively quoted. There's fantastic videos on YouTube you can see of German commanders in conversation with senior British Army officers talking about their experiences. And much more was certainly in archives. Um, and historians want the material, but they don't go get it. Or it's also expensive. I mean, we don't. One of the craziest things is privately, historians discuss the cost of projects. Publicly, we don't discuss money. And I can't get over it because. 
we've got to a state in Britain where we sort of got military history out of its ivory tower and we're through institutional practices sort of trying to shove it back up there. And the minute you have to go to another country or employ researchers and stuff, um, you're, it, the costs absolutely explode. Uh, and it comes down to archival limiter and document ordering and stuff. So I think that structural violence, to use that term, does deter many avenues of study into muted narratives, like the German experience. Um, and you need to have more language skills. And I think uh, people like Niels are doing fantastic work, Victoria Taylor and many others, because they're willing to do the extra graft and get it and then bring it to English. And th and I, think that's a huge deal. I mean, for example, I mean, you've got Frederick Jan, who's a mate of mine in Normandy, he's written The Fox and the, uh, the, the Rore mm -hmm. and the, the, the Hold the Oak Line. I mean, amazing books. And I say to Frederick, why aren't they available in English? And he says, because under French law, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a shortened version, under French law, if he pays someone to be the to translate it into English properly, that person is entitled to 50% of all the future sales of the books because they become a co author. Mm which means he lose, he, he effectively loses money. To put the book in English, he would not just not make any money, he'd lose money. Mm. So it stays in French. If he did it himself, and he's, he can speak English, but he just hasn't got the ability to put it into, into proper, understood, understandable English. And the same, you know, we go down to Montemor, those books about the Polish armor division in French, not in English. The same thing. They can't put them in English because mm. it would cost too much more. So language is an issue generally, but... Something you said there, Jonathan, I've forgotten exactly what it was now, made me think about, you know, we had that, we talked about those, the black, gothic, Re Michael Reynolds, SS runes kind of books. The trend these days in France is to go the other way for the for fear of presenting yourself as some kind of Nazi apologist, sort of um, Third Reich fanatic. So now books that have allied and German content tend to come out with the, the British helmet on the cover and a Cromwell or a, or a mm. Churchill for the opposite reason. So it, like we talked about on Thursday, there's sort of things swinging back both ways. There was the kind of pro-Nazi fetish here, which I think is kind of maybe on the way out slightly, although social media, we'll bring up that in a minute, is pushing up in that regard there. And the books are maybe now going towards the, actually, you know what, the Allies are pretty good in Normandy. Um but this, I want to bring Marty in now about this, this understanding of the German point of view. And the question, you know, you've taken thousands of Americans through normally as I have. Do, do most of our customers, do most of the readers actually care? That's, I, I want to kind of a yes or no from you, Marty, about do they really care about what the German point of view is? No, in a word. I have found overwhelmingly that my experience in tour guiding for almost 20 years has been one that, uh, my customer base expects me to tell stories of heroism and sacrifice relating to the Americans. And that if I begin opening my mouth about the German perspective, it sudden I can see them not only sort of disengage and lose interest. I have also dealt with backlash from that. There was a point where uh, in a tour in Normandy, I think Paul, you'll like this story because I think you knew Hal Baumgarten too. I did. Yeah, I love yeah, Hal. Yeah, yeah. Hal was a lovely human being, and I would um, I, I traveled with Dr. Baumgarten several times, and um, in Normandy we were frequently on the N13 passing Lacombe, and so we would stop at the German cemetery. And you know what happens when you stop at Lacombe, and that you got to go to Whitman's grave, and you got to tell that story, and they're the sort of standard. Stations of the Cross in terms of interpreting the history of that cemetery. And there was a trip where I had Dr. Baumgarten, his wife and his daughter on the bus, in addition to about 30 clients. And we had time. We were on the N13. And I said, let's just stop at the German cemetery. I had even had some people ask me for it. 30 minutes later, by the time I was wiggling us out of the cemetery, I had people accusing me of being a Nazi sympathizer because I took them there. Um, that included Dr. Baumgarten's daughter and wife, to the point where I had people um, in my face asking me, uh, how could you dare to bring a world, an American World War II veteran to this place around these disgusting people that shoved people in ovens? And I got, wow. I got ganged up on to the extent to where I was just like, I need to drop this subject. I wanted to take them on. I wanted to, to duel about this, but I was just not in that position. And I kind of just had to go, all right, well, that was an unfortunate incident that happened. It's time to move on. 
so the reason I give you a quick no and I don't even have to think about it is that I have dealt with, first of all, passive indifference and then actively being accused of being a, a neo-Nazi and a modern fascist. And um, that's I, it only took a couple of incidents like that for me to really pull the throttle back on visiting the cemetery at Orgland or the cemetery at Lacombe. And it really made it very difficult for me to then talk about subjects. Uh, there are two subjects within the Normandy invasion that relate directly to the Germans that I've specialized in, a, specialized in a lot. And that's what happens in the village at Glen, what happens in the village at MFA. And in both incidents, it requires me to present these sort of complicated discussions about the German side. And over the years, I have just gotten to the point where I've just ditched them entirely because it's too difficult. It's functionally too much of an awkward challenge for me to try to take an American audience that is strangely charged up with a combination of German fetishization and then charged up also with the mythologization that was produced mainly by this Ambrose era, that it, it just became too much of a barrier. There were too many barriers for me to get people to the intelligent discussion about the Germans that I just sort of surrendered. Wow. And given that the original purpose of this these two shows was to understand where we are today, 2021, in our understanding of the Normandy campaign, if we're stuck where our audience doesn't even want to hear the German side, then we're not getting anywhere. We're not moving forward, are we? I mean, I tried an experiment a couple of years ago with, with the late Jules Vernon, who, who, who died a few years ago, because he was very interested in the um, the the area of the 83rd Division, American Division, down near Mertis and saint and those areas there, where you get the, the Falschermäger kind of cut off in Sev Island there. We had the idea, uh, because there was no fixed kind of lines there, it wasn't like it was a beach and defenders, we, th we had the idea of doing a tour where we talk about Force A and Force B without telling our customers which is which force. Hmm. And we did, we did it once, but every two minutes, people go saying, are these Americans or Germans? I said, Come, look, we're trying something here. We're trying to tell you a story without you joining in with your preconceived ideas. Just kind of bear with us. But every two minutes, can you tell us whether these are? No, we're just, we're trying something. And we were giving the tour free, by the way. We were doing it as an experiment <laughs> because we found it was a really interesting tool because without knowing who the goodies and the baddies were, as they would perceived it, they're taking on ideas about military strategy without that bias. And we're talking about a force got cut off here. And as soon as we said the force got cut off, they thought it was an allied force because suddenly it becomes the Alamo, doesn't it? And in fact, we were talking about a German force being cut off. And I said their commander, and you can see them starting to kind of feel sympathetic towards this group because they're cut off. I said they can't get back their lines now. And in fact, in this particular position, their lines were north, which is where the allies are coming from generally. But in fact, in this case, the Germans were north. And you could see my group getting all this sympathy. And then they twigged that the... the the force I was talking about was the Germans, and suddenly their entire reaction has changed, and now they want them to die. Now <laughs> they they waited for me to tell them, yeah. So they all got rounded up. They all got shot. Yeah. And that's the problem we're dealing with. It's emotion, isn't it? It's the deep rooted emotion of well, of the problems of goodies and the baddies. Right. I mean, if I could just jump in with one thing very yeah, quickly, please. I I had an extremely negative experience very recently with this exact thing where. Uh, first and foremost, as you know, I'm very interested in what happened in the village at Glen and um, where I am today in terms of comprehending and understanding what happened there. I would not be here if it were not for our friend from Eindhoven. Nils has made basically all of my understanding of this possible. It would not exist were it not for the work that he does. And that's because like one thing that I've experienced I've had in my life was that I uh, became a student at King's College London in 2007, 2008. And while I was there, I was working on things related to U-boats. I was spending all my time at the British National Archives at Kew. And I was doing all this work in Bletchley Park intercepts. And I was there to understand U-boat history better. And I was spending time at the German U-boat archive in Kutschaven. And dealing with those two archives and I just finished paying all of that off last year. Jonathan mentioned money and how we don't talk about that often. And literally that episode in my life of going to King's College was so astronomically expensive that it reached through my, um, through when I was in my late 30s until I was in my 50s. 
paying for it. And so that's that's kind of a significant factor here, which is why I say for someone in the on the North American content to try to reach into this history, it, it's extraordinarily, I think, more difficult, especially when you consider language skills and the fact that German language is not something that's typically offered to Americans. We typically get offered in a school setting, either French or Spanish. But you know, now on to the juicy story. I, in attempting to understand this battle at Klein, with a great deal of help, with absolutely critical help from our friend in Eindhoven, I'm reaching a certain um, a conclusion that, I, Paul, you've heard me mention it, I think, and that is that um, it has been understood through the folklore at all times that at the end of the battle at Klein, that the Germans executed uh, about 21 people. And in examining this further, in a way that was informed by a significant research discovery that I had about the massacre at MAV, where I found those files coincidentally when I was doing U-boat research at the British National Archives. Um, I found that, and I know now a lot about the way that the US Army investigated war crimes in Normandy. And then I, um, as I continued to learn more about Glenn, thanks to Nils, I began to notice something was painfully absent and that there's there's no war crimes investigation and that basically the entire narrative of the you know these these sickening villains from the the 37th Panzer Grenadier Regiment dragged these people out and shamelessly murdered them I'm finding no evidence of that and there was certainly no American war crimes investigation of this I'm not prepared to go the German to announce that the Germans didn't carry out an atrocity there but in a recent, basically, discussion on Facebook with a certain historian specializing in the 101st Airborne Division, I made a couple of points. One was which, one of which was, I find absolutely no American investigation of an atrocity or a war crime at Clyde. And the only accounts that established the war crime narrative were from French civilians who did not eyewitness and could not have eyewitnessed what happened to these men. And with just me saying that, I produced in this historian such a violent overreaction that it caught me by complete surprise to see that someone who has, like me, kind of spent an entire lifetime interested in this subject and has enjoyed learning more about it with each passing year. I saw this person um, dismiss me as foolish and stupid for even breathing this word of possibility um, without even me stating the conclusion, uh, just by stating no evidence of an investigation, the, the eyewitness accounts are people that did not witness and could not have witnessed an atrocity. And that I'm, I'm tagging the story into this discussion because it is exactly what you just said. It's an, an emotional overreaction, like how dare you challenge my preconceived notion of the 17th SS as a batch of murderers. And I have absolutely no idea who you're talking about there. <laughs> Please <laughs> bear me down there. Exactly who you're talking about there. Yeah. Um, no, but this and this is the the interesting thing about this. If we're going to progress, we have to admit we want to we want to know the truth. It's the, it's like the the first step to admit, uh, becoming to curing yourself of alcoholism is to admit you're an alcoholic, isn't it? And I think that we we addressed that on the Thursday show is. We need collectively, as those who talk about history, write about history, um, engage with history, to admit that we have been caught up in biases. We have we have learned things that aren't true, and we have to go back and accept that, embrace it, and say, okay, where can we move forward? And it's interesting. Just in the time it after I announced this show to hosting this show, there was a discussion on Twitter two days ago about two two new books coming out this year about the 12th SS division in Normandy, and both appear to kind of are playing into the runes all over the cover, tanks, tigers, black, silver, uh, fanatics, Hitler's young boys, dying for the Fuhrer, elites, you know, the, the same old, same old, same old. So even in 2021, when I, I would like to think we're one step closer to a more balanced view, I don't know that we really are at all. So, um, Let's bring in, and then we can go into individual kind of enduring myths. I want to bring in the importance of social media and the digital age because the fetishism thing. There's there's gone from the kind of there's the books, there's the black and silver books thing, but there's also the the internet sites. The and just as a Facebook user, I have to monitor. I have to be in a point where 
I have to be careful whose friendship I accept because if they're into, if I see the, the, the scary words are military modeling and German mm -hmm. armored vehicles. And that's not saying that all military modelers are because they're not, but you look at the page and you start seeing lots of it's the it's when they're choosing a German tank commander as their profile pick. That's alarm bells, alarm bells, and you see the kind of graphics with the scrolls, and they've been in Photoshop making up the pictures there with the the overlaid picture of Michael Wittmann in front of a tiger or Otto Carrius or whatever it was, and you just go, No, no, I don't. I don't need you. I don't need you in my friends list. You're probably a really nice guy, but whoa. So let's talk about that, that aspect of the Normandy history that is just out there. And yeah, you know, the, the Michael Wittmann, the tank aces, the, the tiger tank, how do we deal with that? And how, how is that influencing mainstream history? I'll bring you in Jonathan and then Niels, Jonathan, because you're a modern guy. You're younger than us. You're, you're an internet yeah. age person. So like, I really loved the History Channel as a teenager. It was amazing. And there was this program called Weaponology. And Weaponology was brilliant because they're called graphics and stuff. And if you go on YouTube now and you search for peer, actually don't do it now because of analytics and stuff, but you'll find the Weaponology peer clip, which is complete and utter crap. <laughs> um, if you see other documentaries on people firing peers for like, you know, the game promos and stuff, the, they don't know how to fire the weapon. They can't describe it. No one looked into this. And it's called the Peer book, which the Peer Osprey is basically the best thing we've written on the weapon yeah. um, by Matthew Moss, who's a really, really good, really Lovely good guy. So yeah. yeah, so we've got we've got this really dirt position. So I think the those programs, you know, when I was moaning about Hastings and stuff, so they really influenced a lot of programs being made in the '90s and early 2000s, and the early 2000s ones were put on the YouTube when it was going in about, you know, 2006, 2007 and eight, when it was took hours to load up on your internet and all this stuff. So those, if you look, they've got tons of views and they're often referenced in old chat rooms and stuff going back years. And they're a really accessible way for people to engage with the subject. And I blame them for everything. Um, and I think what we got was this feedback effect. Yeah, I mean, I always prefer that feedback effect. It's when one historian repeats what a former historian has said, what, repeating a former historian, quoting a former historian, quoting a veteran who spoke to a historian, and you find them, you can trace them at times, these circular loops of knowledge which don't get us anywhere. Um, and a social media, well, the internet as a whole is amazing. So we've got World War II talk, we've got World War II forum, two of the greatest resources with Access History Forum, forum and Wehrmacht Awards. You've got to be a little careful with some of the stuff on actually quite careful with some of it, but there is excellent discourse. Uh, and then we've got a few new generations like tank archives, tank Our encyclopedia, some really, really good resources, again, different bias. And some of these sites, actually I'll get onto gaming quickly. So some of these sites then, especially with games, people play the games and they blow tanks up and they think that's how it went. But in real, real life, you don't get a notification saying you can't enemy tanks to keep shooting the bugger until it burns. Um, and that was pretty standard in Normandy, you know, that's what they did. Um, but because people view things from a techno fetish angle to an extent, I love the F word because people are hyper fixate on these tiny things. Um, you get a dis you just look at the stats, you're looking at the analyst, the, the numbers, and often people can't explain it. It wasn't until 2016 that uh, Stephen Napier analyzed Goodwood losses to actually good level. Um, so we can't say lots about this sort of stuff because it's, it's all fairly recently discovered. But social media has um, been a problem. So on Twitter, if I try, I can get 2 million views a month easily if I throw a load of good World War II threads up. Uh, whereas I see YouTubers uh, can get into a different cool position. I won't name the names of one or two. Barmark Felton should not be watched by anyone here because I can't stand his love. It's awful. It's really bad. <laughs> try harder, Felton. I, 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 know you, I know you know you can do better, you terrible human. So <laughs> don't, I just, don't, don't hold pull your punch here, Jonathan. You know, I was behaving know. as well. I was hey, behaving. Hey, this is hey, why I had a beer. Hey, Jonathan, quit sugarcoating your words. Get to the <laughs> So I, I heard someone describe him, and I don't I don't know the guy at all, as Wikipedia entries narrated badly over inappropriate footage that I thought was yes. really that pretty much nails it right there. <laughs> and uh, I mean the problem also is so the other other YouTube channels like one thing, when I, one problem is when there's, there is almost everyone will encounter this. You find something, you get really good at it. You do so much work and it's so exciting. You finish your work. Um, and then in my case, I had to learn copyright law, which was 
a thing. But many people then decide they want to move on to the next project quite quickly. And now when we look at how YouTube works, especially with the algorithm changes the last few years, you need constant co content upload to appease advertisers. You can be de demonetized really quickly on military stuff. And some channels which started off really good, I mean, some of them I was blown away by the content, have got to the point where Von Lux 88s is a real thing. <laughs> It's to, and uh, there was one of these in Von Luck the other day by a bloke who I refer to as um, Wearaboo Mr. Rogers. You probably can work out who that is. Um, <laughs> please tell them he's Wearaboo Mr. Rogers. And we've got this problem where they then also have Patreon accounts, and there's a lot of cash. You can be earning 20 to 40K, some of these people, uh, for pumping up additional content. But you've long passed the point of where you're confident in your knowledge. And it's on the periphery of our knowledge, all these mistakes start really creeping in. And especially on German stuff. Uh, if, you're, if you're an English speaker who doesn't speak German, you have to, I, I'm very careful what I say about uh, the Germans in the Second World War. And I, I try and quantify it quite a lot. So I'll comment happily on 277, 271st Infantry Division, uh, 1st SS Panticle, 2nd SS Panticle, I'm quite comfortable with. But you take me away from those units and I'll, I'll quickly say, no, no, we can generally say this or there's that. I'll, I'll back off because it's not my area of speciality, but many people want it to be their area of speciality. And the crazy point of all this is the BBC stopped making documentaries about World War II stuff. I mean, Lucy Worsley got one, but broadly speaking, for the last 10 years, there's been very little. And British museums, although this comes back to archives, British museums could have made a fantastic series of programmes with young presenters, a new generation to, aimed at schools and all sorts but they haven't done it and they yielded the digital space completely and that allowed different people to come in some with um, some popular youtubers have unpleasant views and push them to a mass audience but that said i mean some of the engagement stats they're actually getting aren't as good as they originally appear um uh, which i find quite interesting uh so yeah i mean World War II took well, that's, World War II I, I never claimed to be anything I'm not. I'm self-taught. I've been doing it a long time, but I'm not from the academic background at all. So uh, broadly speaking, my channel has no historical validity whatsoever beyond the caliber of my guests. And I would like to think I have brought in an extraordinary range of guests who really know their stuff on a variety of subjects. And therefore, that gives it some kind of validity. But the public doesn't know this. The public is not very good at discerning what is good and what is poor. And the circle reasoning argument, I think, is very, very good. And if anyone notices, I put a, put a Twitter, uh, did a tweet earlier today about this photo that goes around on the, on the rounds on, of Omaha Beach with the blood, not showing lots of blood and all the dead bodies on the beach. And categorically, it's not showing dead bodies. It's showing men lying on the beach waiting to move off. And it's not probably blood at all. It's the way they've increased the contrast of the photo to make it look like blood, so on and so forth. And this is, this is on a a Facebook page with 30,000 members. It's had hundreds of comments. Oh, those poor guys. All oh, those. It is absolutely not what it purports to be, that photo. The, the people who are, re are reading the caption have been manipulated, their emotions manipulated by a caption that is incorrect. And when I started pointing out, and I wasn't actually saying it was wrong. What I was saying was use your critical skills to look at that photo and examine when it was taken. How much sand is there in the photo? What type of vessels are we seeing in the photo? Because if you ask, answer those questions, you'll determine yourself when that photo was taken. So on and so forth. And all I get is insults. All I get is that, you know, who are you to say this stuff? All that, you know, you think... You, you don't want to be helped. And I'm not saying I know everything, but I know a little bit about Omaha Beach, given that I live 15 minutes away from it and have done for 20 years, you know. But this is the thing about... Neil, I'm going to bring you, because you've been sitting there patiently. You're diligently working away with all your incredible work on the books. I know you've reached out to people like Peter Caddick Adams and myself and Neil. How are you finding that people... Do people want to listen to you generally? It's, it depends a bit. Uh, it's, of course, quite confronting if, if you think you have written a very brilliant book or you think just from, well, I did, a, I did a good job. And then there's some guy you don't know who says, well, you missed this and you missed this and you missed this and you missed this. And the list, I mean, when I read a book, I, I keep a pencil with it. And when it goes to the Germans, there's, I think in 20% in of the sentences, there's something fishy. To say to say the least. Yeah. So um, 
but the, the good people are listening and they're thinking wait there is more information because there's also a lot of uh, people who just don't realize how much material is out there how much knowledge is out there uh, if you look for uh, Jonathan mentioned uh, access history forum which is really excellent it's, it's a bit weird sometimes but it's it's an excellent uh, source where uh, people who share the same interests uh, find themselves and and help each other forward and share information uh, if you're not aware that these places exist because you are only focusing on, on social media to get additional information instead of the more traditional uh, the old school uh, social media which in my which I consider forums to be, you're missing a lot. And it's also a problem, I think, that social media, especially Facebook, has a lot of uh, special groups which, which discuss certain topics. But you have to be a member. It's easy to miss. Uh, if if the wrong things are being said there, there's almost no one to correct it. Uh, while a lot of forums uh, were, and to, to some extent still are, interest, more interesting because you can Google it and you can find it. And other people can get, get it get involved and say well this isn't correct and this isn't correct and uh, and when properly uh managed forums are i find them far more interesting uh to get information and facebook in, in some extent has taken over the role of forums mm. which is a problem because of the the way facebook is is cut up into you know, to all these different groups which is one of the things i do like about twitter because if you write something uh, a lot of people can access it much more easily than on the, the hidden groups on facebook I want to bring in this point that, that Dougal just mentioned there. Uh, maybe the view of fact-checking criticism needs to be seen in, in a good light. And I think that's a very good point because it came up on the Thursday disc. I think it was John Buckley mentioned it. Might have been McManus about revisionist being seen as a, as a bad, a, a dirty word. It's, it's, uh, and surely if history is to move forward, all history is revisionist. Surely. Otherwise you're just repeating. If you're just taking someone else's work, and putting in the words in a different order and using thesaurus, it's not, it's just the same thing. Why is there a, a tendency to view anybody who brings something new as, or, or a different view of something as being bad? Because you've had that, Marty, with the Agrania stuff and your Hemave stuff. Um, I get it with talking about Omaha, I get it. And Jonathan, you get it. We, we all get it with regards to the 88s and the German tanks. Is, what, why does the greater public not see celebrate revisionist history? Because that seems to be one of the hurdles we have to overcome. Who wants to jump in on that, Marty? I think that the reason they they uh, push back on the idea is that everything it it becomes ultimately so intimidating. It I know that I feel this sometimes that I feel like the amount of reading that I need to be doing feels like a lot because I have all these other things going on in life. And I, I like have an article on my desktop right now that I've been trying to get around to reading for over a month. I, I know that I have seen this with people that come on the tours, that there are people that may have done a little bit of dabbling. They watched Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers. They did a little dabbling in some of the secondary source books that were written. And then they come on a tour to Normandy. And I think something that they feel is they feel like they're well read and they are not. And they get to Normandy, and if a revisionist idea comes up, it, I think it just it overwhelms them. That makes them feel like, oh my God, I just, in order for me to feel like I'm a well-read and well-informed person, I would have to not only, I, I would have to do more than just double the amount of reading I'm doing. And for the non-specialist type, for the people who are, um, who haven't, you know, studied it, on a serious level as a professional, it just seems like so much. Not everyone is going to be a history major. And yet the non-history majors, I feel like there are a lot of them out there that want to kind of present themselves as being sophisticated, as having sophisticated and expanded knowledge of World War II history because it, it becomes something that is, it's kind of a cool thing for somebody to know a lot about World War II history. And they get around people that really know it well and people who spend a great deal of time in the historiography, people who spend a great deal of time in the literature and represent, uh, these are people who recognize the uh, periodization of the literature and to modern, postmodern revisions. They recognize all of the different periods of the historiography. And those are people that when they, when they, um, when they get a, uh, when they look into the abyss of what people who are actually serious are doing in terms of the, 
time commitment to know all this, not even just time commitment, but just like financial commitment to know this history. I think that it intimidates them and they push back on it going, it makes them feel better to go, oh, all of this revisionism is bad. There's this one historian that has published about Normandy who was quite close to Stephen Ambrose, who gave an interview where he said, he literally said, there's this negative force at work called revisionist history. I mean, he actually named revisionism as being an enemy of our process of moving toward enlightenment, toward a horizon where we understand things better. And I feel like that's just a, a fussy, cranky old person who doesn't like seeing younger people who know more about it than he does. And so in this way, I'm presenting the answer as being, I think people push back on revisionism out of an emotional reaction more than anything. Yeah, and that, that touches on this idea I was emailed or tweet, tweeted Jonathan this afternoon. It's the people want the comfy cardy version of history, not the challenging version. It's why, you know, I'm a big music fan. You go to a gig and the band there want to play their new album, their concept album, but actually we all want them to play the hits that we know. And 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 that the same applies, I think, to guiding, and I think the same applies to popular history, is you get a quicker, swifter, probably more profitable reaction by playing to the crowd. And that majority crowd of 90% who don't really have the interest in, in discerning history will go, oh, that historian got it. Well, what a brilliant read. I went for it in two days. It's amazing, you know. And the person who does the work diligently poo-pooing the myths and say, actually, this thing didn't happen this way, they get they have to self-publish. They don't get that instant reward, and they get accused of upsetting, you know, the, the, the apple cart. And why are you trying to change all this history? So... Right now in this discussion, we'll go on some more stuff. I think we're we're worse than we were. We we know less now than we did before. We're actually stuck going round in a circle. Um, Niels, you wanna you wanna bring in on something here? Yes. Uh, when we talk about revisionism, the, there's only one thing worse is that's revisionism and German history. Uh, if you go if you mix those two words, it's very common for people to think, and for to a point for good reason, is that. Uh, it's about whitewashing the German uh, uh, history in World War II, and that's that's especially when revisionism is uh, linked to to German. What what people actually mean is, I think the term is neg uh, negativism. Uh, it's what people confuse, but it's it's something I've also encountered when you say, "Well, I'm do I'm re-examining some things," and there's a suspicion in some people that you're whitewashing uh, the German uh, history. And, uh, and all the crimes and everything. So that's when it comes to revisionism and, and German World War II history, that's also a, a, a risky thing. So if you say that you're re-examining uh, things that are hap that happened, people might think that you're trying to place the uh, Germans in a better light. But re proper revisionism is just looking at the evidence and seeing if, if you can come to a different conclusion. And to name one example of this, which, it, which shows why it's important, I be, I've been studying the Continental Peninsula and one of the div, uh, American divisions that has been getting a lot of flack already in 1944 when, when a division commander and regiment commander were uh, uh, replaced is the 90th Infantry Division. Yeah. But if you start looking at what they were up against, I, I'm not quite sure if there's any American unit at that time facing that kind of opposition. And that's... So, that's something that's quite relevant if you want to judge their performance. Yes, they made mistakes, but to what extent were their losses and their lack of success caused by the opposition they were facing? And also, to what extent did they help set the stage in which the Germans they were facing were ultimately defeated? Because if you look a bit closer, it sort of, it does seriously look like that they, they gave the Germans a very bloody nose, which helped uh, other units which came in later uh, finally break through to them. So that's why you need to go back to understand also the Allied side of the story. If you don't know what they were up against, you can never understand what really happened and understand the context and the sacrifices. No, I agree there. And yeah, the 90 division, I was up at Moncastro a couple of weeks ago, and you know, you look at that terrain there and who they're facing, and it's just it's crappy. And the only, the only decent book I've ever read about the 90 division, the John Colby one, War from the Ground Up, which is now like 
the chocolate fire guard to find. They just can't find it anywhere. It's hard to get. And the books that you can buy about the 90th are the rather, they're still a bit crap. They're a bit, anyway, so that we, we, we digress a bit. But we're kind of um, an hour and a half into this. Shall we, while we've got time now, we've got these people watching us, run through some of the most entrenched myths and kind of examine them without going off into too long about them. What 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 are the most repeated ones? And let, let's let's the, 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 oh we've got no, we've got to bring in Holger everyone. Let's we've got to bring in Holger. <laughs> Eckert, so I completely forgot about that. So the biggest dramatic movement in the understanding of the German history German history in Normandy in recent years has been the revelation of the book by Holger Eckert with all these wonderfully fantastic accounts by German. <laughs> Uh, about book. here they were right. there. Here they were. <laughs> yeah, the author Eckert. But it, it we have to address it because it was the third best selling book in Normandy one year, the fourth best selling other it has sold shitloads of copies. People are, I'm all pretty much a week doesn't go by pie where I get some former customer who emails me and says, Have you seen this book, Paul? What do you think of it? And I go, Yes, it's shit. <laughs> Um, and so let's let's talk about it. And basically, for those who don't know, it purported to be a guy who discovered his father, who was a reporter for the German army in World War II, and in interviewed with these Germans, and he compiled these book these accounts into a, into a single volume, and, and they became a thing. And some various historians quoted these these sections in their books. They got into the media, this, that, and the other. And very quickly, some of the people yourself were a leading light in this, Jonathan. You realize it was all utter bollocks, wasn't it? Um, and you have absolutely, in your tweet that goes around the rounds, completely trashed this guy. You can't find the person. You can't find the publisher. You can't find trace of the people interviewed. That There's mistakes in language use. There's mistakes in geography. There's, And yet... It's still there, and yet people are still talking about it. So, what? What's well, Jonathan? You you've done probably the most work on this. What's well? Well, you all have really. But Jonathan, just give us a summary of of the of of what damage that has done to our understanding of the Germans in Normandy. Well, the Normandy campaign generally. So I was given this by a mate of mine who bought it, and he also bought the Wolfgang Faust stuff. Um, who, by the way, is a very bright chap. It's not Dougal. Hey, Dougal. Uh, good day. Um, this, this book is, ah, it, I think a lot of this is generational and I'll come back to that and I'll say, okay, boomer at some point, And it's horribly generational, but it'll, it'll make sense. I promise you it'll make sense. So this book, um, you know what I'm saying? I think people do care for mutant narratives. And I was recently told by Santa's lecture that mutant narratives don't exist. They do. If you're watching this seriously, um, talk to historians of uh, different topics, that mutant narratives are a huge problem. The Germans in Normandy, French prison, French colonial prisoners of war in Normandy who end up aiding the Allies in some way, they're a muted experience of Normandy. A huge, huge numbers of these topics. Now, historians want cool stuff to put in their books, and this book was originally highlighted, although we had serious questions about it, by Giles Milton, who for me is an early modernist. He's He has written on World War II, but he's not who I would associate as a World War II historian. And then it was Robert Kershaw who went, hey, some bits of this sound all right to me. Um, so when I got given this, because I was not gonna, I was not gonna buy this because it was originally an ebook. Um, I sat down and actually read. I read half the book, then flicked through the rest of it. I was going to do a chapter by chapter analysis, and I just thought I'd lose the world to live because <laughs> it's monographic. It's it's hyper visceral. The level of gore in here is astonishing, and I, I do mean that. When I yeah. read this, and I could not think of a single veteran's account of the campaign from either side that I had read that got anywhere near it. And it was also convenient that everyone, all the key participants are dead. Like, that's a great thing. So the question I had, though, was who the hell's Holger Bloody Eckert? And it's published by Spreck Media. Who is Spreck Media? Now, this is, book is still sold as history by Amazon right now. Um, I would go back through the original thread of how I worked out this was complete crap. And it was going through line by line. Key details of rot are wrong. The, the level of violence in everyone, it, every chapter is astonishing. Each account in it, from recollection, had notions of Eurofascism. Now, that was strange. So it basically argues that the European race is going to defeat the Slav. And if you're keen on your far-right politics and keeping an eye on these sort of things and how World War II plays into it, some people are, 
this book is a basically a Euro fascist recruiting manual for extremists. It's a, a serious problem child. Now, I tried to work out who Eric Hertz was, and I came up that he's between, when this came out, between 50 and 60 years of our age. I'm also convinced, well, I've become convinced he's dead because there was meant to be a follow-up to these books, and they sold so well. Um, when it emerged, uh, e-publishing was doing really, really well, and I knew mates who bought houses writing absolutely atrocious sci-fi for 99p. And I mean, this is so bad. There was no plot. It was just sex and guns the whole way through. It's like new, newer, newer dime novels, and you could put an ebook up, and it would it would just fly because not enough people were pumping stuff out. Unlike now, now Eckert's he's British. I can tell you that much from his use of language in this book because it's not the stuff I'd expect from an American. Um, and he uses uh, predominant terms that we would associate. So Mar Marty's with our off, off the hook there, then. <laughs> Say again? Marty's off the hook then. We're not going <laughs> <getting> Marty. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, for me, this, this guy becomes, is a pure ghost. Uh, it also shares a lot of, each chapter shares a lot of linguistic traits and structure, structure with the other accounts. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. If you've got any material on 21st Panzer, you'll know the chapter on him, 21st Panzer, just cannot be true due to the vehicles in it. Um, and there's some very, very bizarre accounts regarding other tanks, armored vehicles, air attack, bombing, mystery weapons. And the other day, a historian who I won't say here because they may be watching, who should be ashamed of themselves, defended this as being accurate in part. Now, uh, it wasn't Kershaw who, going off years ago, if you glance through this or I've heard of it, you'd say, I I'm convinced also there is some truth in this. So I'm convinced that some of it comes from recollections or half stories told at some point to the author because there's weird bits which do chime to a knowledgeable hand who's keen on their 80s history and probably did speak to veterans because odds on, or there's an association link of, of something. Yeah. Um, but I would never use it. I would never cite it. Anyone who claims it is reliable now in 2021, uh, walk away, give up, bin it. Actually, you'll, or hold it and slap yourself in the face as a form of punishment. Well, I, while, while and it's generational. Talking. I just mm. I double checked on Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, and Amazon.fr. It has a combined one thousand six hundred reviews. Mm. Ninety two percent are five and four star. Of course, and, the, and a lot of the negative reviews are not about the quality of the history, but for the gore. There, yeah. I wanted to read this, and it was full of bl naughty, you know, blood. Not that I wanted to read this, and it was a load of old shit. It was just that it was the it was the, the graphical nature of it they didn't like. So. And this is this is this is now. It would have, I'm assuming when it first came out, that would have been even higher, the percentage because it, now there have been people who've read what you've said, other people have said, and the Daily Mail, even the Daily Mail, I hate the Daily Mail, took it, pulled it apart, and said this is kind of mainly bollocks. And um, and yeah, so so Marty, you know, th this here we are. The point of these discussions is where are your understanding of Normandy as 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 in the terms of the history and a book made up of absolute nonsense is riding high in the charts. It comes up it's in, on one page. I'll check in. I'll let you talk in a second. In German military histories, it comes up on the same page as the diary of Anne Frank. Oh now, the diary of Anne, I mean, so, <laughs> and I'm, I, by the way, I'm suggesting that that is an incredibly reliable book. I'm saying that the, the whole records book should not be on the same page. Shouldn't be mentioned the same breath as something as world changing as the diary of Anne Frank. And yet there it is there on the same page, it comes up there. And for the uninitiated, you would assume therefore it has the same historical pedigree and validity of the diary of Anne Frank. So Marty, tear, tear, tear it in your arsehole if you wish. <laughs> yeah. Don't come to me if you want to have hope in humanity, because I've, I've turned, Holger Eckerts is just the latest shot in a barrage of things that have made me lose my faith in the way that people can consume historical knowledge. Um, as smarter minds have already d demonstrated, the, the book is complete nonsense. And the thing that really um, made me sort of lose hope and uh, um, discouraged me about this was that in the United States on Amazon, and our Amazon's a little different than yours, that book was number one military history for about eight weeks around the 75th anniversary. And it was just, it was daily. I mean, I, I, there was a point where I think I had 30 or 40 messages per day of people recommending that book to me. 
you know, former clients, people involved in history who should have known better uh, because I don't pretend to be a particularly smart person on the subject, but when I bought my copy, I am ashamed to admit that I went out and bought a copy. Jonathan, don't judge me. But I, I bought my copy, it came in, and I just kind of briefly looked at, at the, the organization of the book. That's something I do with every book I get. I get look like what their chapters are organized like. And um, I saw that there was an account from, from a soldier who was supposedly fighting in the vicinity of, um, of Utah Beach. This interests me just because of the airborne fascination. And so I jumped to that and that's where I started reading. And I don't think I got three pages in until the quote that I specifically remember, the point at which I started to smell a rat. The the um, Iceland has a saying. I can't say it in Icelandic, but they their saying is, "I know rotten shark meat when I smell it." But I got I got to this quote that where he where this person supposedly um, stumbled on the bodies of dead Americans, and he quoted, and he they were just kind of ghoulishly described, and. Uh, how they were, he believed that they were executed. And the quote that stuck out was, he said, it looks like the SS boys have already been at work. And this was before noon on June 6th. And that's the point where I went, wait a minute now. Huh, how is that possible? And then it just went downhill from there. The book just descended into um, so many question marks and so many things that couldn't be couldn't be reconciled that it made me look back fondly at the good old days when people when people used to argue about Guy Sayer and Le Soldat Oublier. Um, it made me think, well, back then, at least we had intelligent discussions about the problems of this book, the problems of Forgotten Soldier. Um, the, the problem then got, for me at least, worse because people continued to just barrage me with, hey, have you seen this book? You need to check this book out. And I had my doubts and I didn't take action on it. You know, shamefully, I admit that I didn't do anything meaningful about it until other people like Niels began to speak out about the book. Um, I have a, a very, an even more discouraging recent update for you gentlemen. And that is that a, an acquaintance here locally in Louisiana who teaches military history, not general history, but military history, um, recently asked me about the book. And I said, oh, you know, that book's, basically BS, right? And this professor was mortified because that professor in 2020 still had that book on a syllabus about modern military history. Oh, good grief. Yeah. So enjoy that, guys. I don't want anybody to have hope. I mean, this, this bring, I'll, I'll bring Neil's in in a second because Neil did some work. It brings us back to this idea of where we are in history because there's this divergence in what the type of the books are. And there's that this is still playing to some extent the fetish, the fetish crowd, the, the gore, the sensation, the SS boys, the daggers, the blood, the grenades. And yet, supposedly, um, professional historians are also buying into it. A lot of a lot have spoken out against it, but some of and it's like, well, what's going on there, folks? And then the other side of the thing, and I, you know, although we talk about the Germans and the Allies come in. There's particularly from your side, the pond, Marty, we have those rather syrupy books about how wonderful the American soldier is and the, the gods you know, that praise, praise the law. They went out there and did this and, and they, the mom's apple pie, the, the feel nice, the comfortable warmth. They were all God fearing boys. Um, and I'm not saying they weren't. So there are, there's a tendency by some people to write for the audience they know they've got and yeah, keep on putting people, out for those people. Um, yeah, a point that I often make is that I remember what World War II history in the United States was like before Tom Brokaw published The Greatest Generation because it was very different than what World War II history has been since. I... I, I I piss off customers when I say I think his book has done more harm than it has in good for the balance to understand what these men went through. It's 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 a gender it's it's a gender driven history, yeah. um, and I'm sure he's a very nice guy. And I'm uh, you know I know he overcame cancer and that I'm sure you know, but I just don't think it served any real purpose in our understanding at all. So, um. So where are but where are we in our in our in our interpretation? Where are we in our understanding the normally campaign? I mean, what 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 of, of the four the four of us here, Marty, you're you're, you're the older one like myself. Are, are you in twenty twenty one on a path 
where you think you're learning more or is the end of the tunnel getting further away? What, where do you think you are? End of the tunnel is further away. Uh, my final answer. Um, I, I would just mention one quick um, example of this. And that is that I, maybe you gentlemen have seen it as well. And that is I was bombarded for a long time. I shouldn't make that past tense because it still happens with this email and it was it would come to me as an email then i would see it endlessly in facebook quotes or facebook posts rather um it was about an american fighter pilot named bill overstreet and a dogfight that he supposedly had over the city of paris at some point in 1944 after d-day no specifics are mentioned and his claim was overall that as a part of this dogfight that he pursued a German ME-109 and the aircraft flew beneath that lowest span of the Eiffel Tower and Overstreet pursued him through the Eiffel Tower with guns blazing in his P-51. And that, that one example has, that's what broke my spirit. That's what broke me. And it was because that maybe i don't know if you guys have seen it or not but it was I've thrown seen the painting. there's a paint you can buy a painting of it at least yeah. by at least one there may be more than one of all i know yeah yeah there was a painting that was ultimately created within this world of aviation art that was based on bill overstreet's personal account and uh you gentlemen don't need me to point out that it never happened it's nonsense it's fantasy is what it is and yet that story proved to me it made me confront my mortality because yeah. no matter how much I told people, I find absolutely no evidence of the Luftwaffe reporting this happened. I find absolutely no evidence of any of the German units in a Paris that this is before the liberation. So this has to be androgynously at some point between June 6th and say August 25th. I find absolutely no evidence of this. And as something you mentioned already, Paul, is that I would simply... Um, bring that up to people, and I would just have invected, direct, invective directed at me for even suggesting that it might not be an entirely true story. And in using this as my example, I, I say that this is what has caused me to conclude that we're losing ground. That, and it's because yeah. because no matter what I write, no matter what I publish, no matter what I do, I'm never going to be able to take down something like that. And and mythologies like that will as a result of this brave new world that we're a part of, they're going to endlessly spread in all of the social media platforms. And it has led me to adopt this saying that I'm not sure that this is something that's well known outside of the United States, but there's this old quip, Newton Minow was right. And Newton Minow was the uh, federal communications uh, agency director um, back in the 1960s. And Newton Minow is still alive. And he provided this quote in commenting about the quality of American television broadcasting in the 1960s. And in the quote, he said that if you turn on your television on any given day at any given time, you will see a vast wasteland. And I think that Newton Minow was right. And I think that what he said about TV applies to World War II history. I think it's when we talked earlier about revisionist history being a bad being perceived badly look at just in the last few years how the fact checking websites have now been completely dismissed that all the people who don't all those snopes things that were that were set out to say is this thing true and they'd investigate it and now people say well they're wrong as well so you're, you're in this spiral of disbelief about everything. and people want to believe what they want to believe and no amount of evidence will sway them away from it and the other one I, I know it's not world war ii i get the email sent all the time about the jane fonda one the vietnam one and i'm not saying jane fonda what she did was was advised i'm not saying she was a great person i'm just saying that the version of the story that does the rounds is far removed it's quote quoting pilots that didn't exist yeah, the, yeah. The, this this thing goes and when you point out that I would just check the check check some of the names in that thing before you forward it on to twenty more people. Just search the names that are in that because you'll find these people don't exist, and and they don't they don't want to do it because no no no. And so how can we compete with that? How can we compete with a with a world that doesn't actually want to to understand this history? Um, I think I'm with you, Marty. I, I kind of after Thursday's talk, I was kind of optimistic about the future. Now I've taken a couple of steps back again, but. Jonathan and Niels, you're the younger two of us here. Where, where do you think it's going to go the next two years, 10 years, let's say? Niels, you know, when your book comes out, will that, I mean, I'm, I'd love to think that makes a difference. 
But where, where do you think we're going to be in 10 years' time? I think it depends absolutely on what uh, po the most popular uh, media outlets, uh, most popular authors are going to do. Uh, they set they set a stage. Uh, uh, they bring a story to a very large uh, crowd. Uh, if they listen to what we're saying, if they're putting more effort in, hopefully because they realize that they can say uh, we found something new, uh, as a uh, that that's commercially interesting, and that they uh, improve on what on the story they're telling. That's what I'm hoping. Uh, whether or not it's worth the effort uh, from a commercial point of view is is another matter. But I think that's the only way uh, we we will move forward. With one remark I'd like to make, I think at least uh, that the younger generations are going to be a bit less uh, nationalistic in a, in their approach. Uh, be more curious about the other side, uh, have more, having more questions uh, without being afraid to uh, to upset anyone, uh, their grandparents, their great grandparents, because they're no longer there. Uh, I hope that's going to change a bit. Uh, how successful that will be, uh, only time will tell. I'm not extremely hopeful, but I, I, I try to be hopeful. Jonathan, what's your view? Where where are we? Where are we going to be? So. I think we're in an awkward place to an extent where truth and friction seamlessly slide together. Uh, the subject has become, I mean, World War II has become broader than we would ever consider. I mean, Hastings had an absolute tantrum in uh, America and his article got absolutely poo-pooed. There wasn't really a kernel of point to it. It was uh, very much, uh, apologies for old viewers, an okay boomer moment. <laughs> um and I think actually the generational trope is really important on this. So currently uh, we, I have a problem. The IWM has been openly stating that there was a black journalist on D-Day. And that stemmed from uh, a, a couple of really strange blog articles, oddly enough. So I contacted them and said, hey, can you, can you tell me how you came about this? And they, they deleted the first post on Twitter. They didn't delete the one on Facebook. So after an absolute arduous process they they wouldn't accept it was wrong uh they deleted the post from both they wouldn't fact check either so we have a situation in 2021 where national british museums which are funded by dcms and anyone here who read the russia report will be aware that there were societal resilience responsibilities that these institutions failed in um because we're dealing with i mean i can go on about social media warfare for a while but many accounts have by followers or have uh farmed followers for them to boost their appear appearance and view counts and stuff. It's a genuine problem. But we, you then have to try and counter this. And our own national museums are doing nothing. Um, so to counter, uh, to currently counter Hastings, to counter Beaver's book uh, and Hastings, you need to go back to the sources they use. You need to go to the archives. Currently, it, I worked out it will take me, just using national archives, 10 times the amount of time it took me from 2010 to 2015 to access the records. Okay, 10 times the amount of time in terms of visits because of their document ordering restrictions. And you people go, okay, this, this, is, this is your problem. I'm like, okay, cool. So we have a kid on a council estate who's working nine to five, extra hours as well, uh, will not be able to access their heritage because that's basically when the archives are open. Fine, okay. So then you want to go to the IWM. They've got sources you need to check that are quoted in other books. And currently, you can't access their archives due to COVID, uh, but you can pay for them to copy your records. And we've now had payable access introduced in the UK. OK, that's, you know, that's pretty bad. I mean, that's absolutely, to my mind, unconscionable that we have uh, gate keeping this bad from UK institutions, but it's the world we live in currently. Um, and then we also come back to that these institutions won't, I mean, the 12 SS books we mentioned earlier will yep. have the, one of them, I'm pretty sure, is all based on secondary pre-published sources. Uh, many books rely on th these. Um, trick, um, you rely on these <laughs> these books <laughs> because you recycle the material from them because it's, it's cost effective to do so. It's easy. And people like easy work for churning out cash cows. Now, what I always say is we have to work harder and do better and the younger generation, because I'm a millennial, I've come to accept this over time, and the Zoomers. <laughs> the Zoomers, I mean, they've got their shit together, seriously. Talk to any Zoomer and they're pretty good. It's us millennials who are arguably letting the side down a bit. So we've got to step up. We've got to work harder. Um, and we've also got to accept the older generations may not accept what we want. 
but want to say um i have a policy of blocking no one on twitter which is can be a problem but it does open up discourse for people who may not normally be yeah enter it um uh so i do have hard right individuals share my stuff and comment on it and I, I do engage with them and over time i've had emails from people saying they've changed their lives because they ask how many people get into the hard right stuff through world war ii through the ss being this warrior elite um and we also have problems i mean like um uh, I, I still think that western militaries are pushing uh, completely dirt accounts and i was told uh, who was it um uh, gary sheffield said that he was briefing against the um uh, von luck narrative from 2000 to 2006 um what I find bizarre is I talk to young officers and mid-ranking officers and they tell me I'm wrong and they have this view of narrative and the campaign, which according to lecturers at Sandhurst isn't being taught there. And some of these people have graduated under the times when staff have been teaching on Normandy um, and staff college when allegedly this hasn't been taught. So where is our own professional military? And we know this goes all the way up to the top of the mm. UK military because of the nature of when they entered the subalterns and did courses for the you know, 80s to 2000s. Um, so there's clearly in institutional reticence to change their mindset, perhaps. Um, one area I am keen on is that when people turn 50, the joke is they suddenly get interested in World War II. Uh, hmm. Niels and I are interested and we're younger. There's loads of games and stuff pushed at our generation. And there is a huge amount of interest. And what I want is I think that when people talk about engaging the youth, we should be talking about looking down we shouldn't be talking about 40 year olds and kids we need to be looking at the it's about the kids marty it's about the kids sorry just to get that <laughs> but it we have to be looking at getting many of the younger demographics in because they are interested and i think this means that commercial tours by ledger and stuff need to change they need to be marketing it younger having more done i know ben main's doing very well uh, yeah, uh, yeah. guiding for them he's, he's pushing really good stuff but we need to think what do the younger generation want and they probably actually don't what you think they want um, I, and I found Marty's stuff here absolutely fascinating. His insights are, are, are genuinely damning on parts of the market. Yeah. Um, and I think people don't want to be challenged to an extent. But at the end of the day, if what's the point? Because if if people don't want to be challenged, have your myths, slap it up. Let's all. I, I could do something else for ten years. I, I don't care. I'll mm -hmm. wait till my generation become fifty and buy it. But yeah. it, we need to progress it. And as a result, although this is a long way round. I am somewhat optimistic, though, because I look at the analytics we're getting online from younger gen demographics, and they're positive. So I think the market's changing, but it requires the establishment to accept we need well, more digitized open access across the board. Because currently, and I think it's, just it's also to, to jump in, it, we shouldn't just be teaching the history. We should be teaching critical thinking more as well. We should be teaching people because, OK, I'm an academic style. When you go and get your degree, you're taught how to. Uh, um, analyze uh, um, archives and, and, and use your sources. But the public who buy books and the public are driving the industry. They're the ones buying the books. We need to teach the public. And I'm including myself as a public as well, because I'm a buyer of books, how to be, how to think critically, how to take things and look at them objectively and to say, is what I'm being told the correct version of this? How can I work out my own version of this? Give me the tools for me to interpret this battle in my own way. Give me the tools for me to look at the evidence for myself and not be presented with a with an editorial rather than the fact. It's the way the news is going, isn't it? You know, we're, the old day of someone telling us the facts. Look at the events of London last night. Everything now is you're being told one person's view of the events of yesterday. I want to be told what the events are. And then I can make my own decision about the interpretation of those events, but that's not the way the world is going. But quickly, as we're going to, we've been two hours in, one round each, myths, things you'd like to see changing with regards to German history. And I'll go first because it's my show. I would like to see books. I'd like to see a happy medium between the books that say every German gun was an 88 and every tank was a tiger. And at the other end of the extreme, you have the ones that go into too much detail that actually bores me. The ones where they go, no, no, it was the X, mo the, the model 17 version with the L shape, with, with the second pattern wheel. No, no, that's too much. I want, for, I mean, not necessarily too much, to, but it's, I want that happy medium where I'm being given the correct information, but not dropping off a cliff of geekiness. And I'm finding that the books and the resources I'm reading are one or the other. It's either it's an 88 or, or, a, or a tiger, 
or there's a whole page about exactly which model it is and why you can tell that because that left hand bit of skirt there is the one made in the factory on the left hand side of the street in Hamburg, <laughs> not on the right hand side of the street. And you can tell that because the shade of grade is uh, gray is one shot, you know, that that's too much for me. So that would be my, the change I'd like to see is people hitting a, 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 a balanced, nuanced version in between those extremes. That's what I would like. Niels, what's your what's the biggest thing that grips your shit about the perpetual the, the the myths of Normandy? What's the one thing that you'd like to change? I like I just generally like uh, when people write books about any units that they base significant amount of time and energy on the other side. Whether you're writing from a German perspective, whether you're writing for a, an Allied perspective, pay attention to what's on the other side because that will tell a lot more on what the side you're most interested in uh, experienced and what happened. And that's, I think, if people start doing that, and there are books about uh, around that, that at least can help you get uh, that information without going very deep into the archive. It's out there. Just look for it, pay attention, and put the effort in. Great stuff. Um, Jonathan, what's the, the, the one thing you'd like to just remove? <laughs> I'd like bet actually better archive access across the board. Loads of, loads of digitized content, so people can't say we can't get hold of it. Victoria Taylor had one of hers hacked this week, so she couldn't use that. I want loads of great archive access and uh, more more people from more backgrounds. There, uh, sort yourself out. Uh, more people from more backgrounds uh, commenting on it because. The more diverse we go on this stuff and the more first-hand accounts we have to underpin it, the more interesting it is. We can't just have German divisional commander say X is Y and Y is Z. We want to hear from the troops on the ground and that stuff is often tucked away in archives and we need it all dragged out all over again and it'll be fantastic. Yeah. Marty? Well, I like what Jonathan just said because I'm kind of in this awkward situation now where I'm effectively cut off from ordering this document that is kind of critical to what I do, which is the ind individual deceased personnel file. Oh, yeah. It's all, it's a fun, it's functionally impossible now to get the, um, the, either the national archives of the army because the, the files are divided up between the two. It's functionally impossible to get those with, with absolutely no um, definition about when we might get a response for a submitted inquiry. But um, to make one specific comment, I would like the mythology of the Koreans to go away. <laughs> because I, I had this weird personal connection with the story about the Koreans because I was called on by the Korean government to find the stuff in the Ambrose files when I was still working there to provide the proof about Koreans on D-Day. And it has interested me to watch the way that that story has grown to the point that Beaver started a book talking about the Koreans in Normandy and using the name Yang Kyung Jong, which is a human being who never actually existed. Wow. Yeah, and for those who don't know, that was that was just this story of, of Koreans on Omaha Beach, and it's now you know you you when you read the article now you know his inside leg measurement, what he had for breakfast that morning. Every, you know, it's it's as usual they've taken a shred of information and just built an entire narrative and story on this this fallacy. And it, you know, we're we're back where we started with the fact that the public and and not just the public historians are devouring tour guides are repeating these things. The, and we we're stuck with the pendulum swinging. I mean, the MG forty two is Omaha Beach. We could perhaps end with that. You know, it's either they were all MG forty twos or there were none. It's like, <laughs> Come on, guys. You know, it's somewhere in between the two. Surely, isn't it? Can't we just find nuance? But as we said in the Thursday show, I think the thing that I went to bed that night thinking is that the, the thought was that nuance isn't sexy, though, is it? No. Sensation is sexy. You know, all the paratroopers drowned is sexy. All the paratroopers mm -hmm. missed their drop zones is sexy. And I don't mean I'm not dismissing death. But you know what? Most of them landed quite near their target and actually made it there quite quickly. That That's not sexy. Um. And, and we, we need to embrace that actually the truth is often falling in that rather gray area of not being sensationally exciting and embracing that for what it is and, and say, OK, let's let's we, we shouldn't every time it swings one way, we should swing it back a bit, but not push it right the way back. So it's swinging. And that's what's happening, I think, is that it's that it's it's getting worse in some ways. It's getting worse. Um and for the record, folks, I mean, we all have slightly different opinions on it. There were some MG42s in Omaha Beach. No one is saying there weren't. Yeah. And no one is saying that they were all. Well, I'm not saying they were all MG. It's just 
just just accept the fact there were some. That's it. What you know, but anyway, any other any final comments before we bring this to an end? And and um or because I think my people are going to be going off and committing suicide soon if we're not careful. <laughs> We've had a long, long time. People calling up Samaritans to get help. Um, but any anything we want to address uh, as closing remarks about the serious subject of the analyzing of Normandy history? Anything we want to want to add? Niels, Jonathan, Marty, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I think anyone who's watching this and has any interest in it, hopefully you found this interesting because uh, it's the story of how to get we get to where we are. Uh, you've probably actually got something to add. I can't think of anyone I've met who doesn't have something to add in some way if they, they dig a bit. So we, we always need more people diving in, throwing their hands out there and doing a load of great work. I mean, uh, Andrew Newsom's done amazing work in identifying casualties, for example, which no one else really yeah. looked into despite the records were there. So this, it's, it, it is, it's a great subject because anyone can add to it. It's so big. That's it. It's just so big. And also, I suppose, in turn from that is for the people who are watching history, reading history, is spread yourselves out beyond just the big hitters. There's nothing wrong with reading the big hitters, but there are some amazing small fish on Twitter and Facebook and self-publishing who are doing incredible work to a nuanced, detailed level, but they're just not getting their head above water because they're bombarded. You know, you look how when the book, the big books come out, how the bookshop splurge with the big cutout stands and things and the, 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 the more obscure books got kind of hidden on the bottom shelf there. And, and that's, that's unfortunate. Um, but it's, I don't think it's going to change, but just again, Critical thinking, read widely, listen to what people say from different countries, read in different languages. Don't take everything you read at face value. Question everything. Look for sources. I, I'm, I'm a monthly, another tip I, is that the amount of people I read who never – my first thing I do when I get a book is I look at I look at the acknowledgements, see if I'm there. It's always good. But no, <laughs> the acknowledgements to see who, who that person is influenced by and the big bibliography and the sources. That's the first thing I do. And sometimes there's some books, and Heimdall are great, by the way, but there's never sources. There's no, and there's no indexes either. So sources, bibliography, acknowledgements are the first thing I check. And then I actually dive into the book. And then people I meet who, who don't even check the footnotes, don't even read the bibliography, they don't, even, and they don't seem to want to care where the knowledge comes from. If their favorite historian said it, as far as they're concerned, that's good enough for them. And I'm saying... Don't just assume that historian has got it right. Because I can speak as a guide. I have said utter bollocks over the years. <laughs> and I would rather someone question me and say, I think you're saying bollocks. The thing me and Sean play a lot is these stories we've been telling and you realize you don't know where you actually got them from in the first place. You can't find the yeah. books. And you've been saying them, and they've got a good reaction. They're nothing, nothing earth shattering. They're just a little thing, a little throwaway thing. And you go, where did I get that from? And you realize you can't remember where you got it from. You can't find it anywhere. And if you, I, I now, my rule now is if I can't find where I got it from, I just throw it away now. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, had, I had one of those happen recently where I was challenged about where I got a story from and I thought about it. And then I was like, where did I get that? And I looked it up and it came from Von Koisgen. Oh dear. Yeah, at which point I was like, yeah, I guess I should stop telling that story now. Uh, and and for folks what, watching, Van Koisken wrote a number of books, Point du Hoc, Dublin 62, Omaha Beach, a, a German historian of incredible passion and <laughs> dubious <laughs> attention to detail, possibly. Incredible <laughs> passion. That's one way to put it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, to be fair, there is some good stuff in his uh, – there's some good photos um, – and there's some information that his, his use of graphics and maps and, and bunker dissections, I think, is quite good. Um, but beyond that, there's a lot of supposition. And yeah. um, I've got I've got my Christopher Hitchens sweatshirt on today. Um, <laughs> what can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And it is a, a motto I live my life by these days. Anybody can say anything, but... I want to know what your sources are, and you saying something does not make it true. Uh, and that that's my rule for life now. I, I The late, great Christopher Hitchens, um, who was a, was a uh, writer for Vanity Fair, he wrote on a variety of topics. He ended up becoming a very prominent atheist, but don't let that put you off if that's not your thing. He was an incredibly brilliant person, allowing telling humans with their frailties with their brains and just to be 
to be um to be objective to to look beyond the surface so uh yeah read, read a bit of christopher hitchens with my tip anything else neils martin anything any final comments no, I think uh, we'll go. Well, let's go to the pub. Well, we can't go to the pub. Because the pub <laughs> here, but I'm going to go to the fridge. So thank you very much for watching, everybody. Um, in terms of what we were coming up, absolutely busy. I think I'm busy every night for the next seven nights. It's the War Games night tomorrow night, and then it's Burma week. Looking forward to Burma week. James Holland, Richard Duckett, Lucy, everyone's coming on talking about all aspects of the Burma campaign. And then after that, it's Great Escape Week. So busy, busy uh, uh, end of the month coming up for me. But in terms of everybody watching, thank you incredibly for joining us, watching us tonight, enduring this two hours, 15 minutes of, um, well, no, it was two hours, we started late, two hours of normal discussion. Thank you, Niels, and for keep an eye on Niels on Twitter. His account is criminally unfollowed. Uh, Jonathan has lots of followers on Twitter, but definitely check out Niels. Marty's not so big on Twitter, but Facebook, and just check out what he's doing and his articles he writes for American Rifleman, this, that, and the other. <laughs> and and me, I'm on Twitter, I'm all over the place. But yeah, folks, thanks for watching, everybody. And thank you, Marty, for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for Niels. Hopefully, people have found something interesting with this. And um, we will come back and discuss oral histories and veterans' testimonies in future shows. So I don't know when that will be, but watch this space. As usual, check out the links below. Check us out on Patreon. Follow our social media feeds. This is Paul Woodadge for World War II TV saying thank you very much for watching. I'll see you all again. Good night.